these suburban sheds filled with the usual lawn mowers, rakes and wheelbarrows, you'd be way off. Because Ian Watchhorn uses his shed to keep alive a craft that's centuries old. Ian makes a big range of 17th to 19th century instruments, including lutes, guitars, violas and violins, in the same way they were made back then. I see myself as, I guess, conserving an aspect of history. It's a, a way of exploring the, the way music might have been heard. The first thing is to go to the original instrument. You study it, you draw it, you photograph it, you analyse it, you talk to other people who know the instrument, you gather all the information you can about it. Um, and then my second step is always these days to prepare a technical drawing of the instrument. There's something about the sound that these early instruments make that is very, very particular. And it's just, when I first heard it, when I heard the early recordings and I heard my first instruments, I thought, that's just extraordinary. And there's just a delicacy in the intimacy of that music is um, something that still amazes me to this day. I've always tended to use um, hand tools and so in, over the years I've nosed around and found the most efficient ones I could possibly find and it ends up being that the, the tools that they used when there were no power tools are still the most efficient hand tools. This is a, um, an old Scottish panel plane. It's Originally, a work about itself, It's isn't an it? amazing bit of equipment, yeah. Just feel the weight of it. Oh gosh. Yeah, that's perfectly that's the thing. balanced though, perfectly isn't it? Perfectly balanced, but it weighs a ton. Yeah. Which means once you get it moving, the momentum's incredible and it doesn't chatter, it doesn't rub, it doesn't do anything uh, apart from cut wood very, very efficiently. The woods that I use are determined by my customers, really. They ask me to build for them the most historically accurate uh, instruments that I can build, and so. Obviously, part of that is going to be sourcing the timbers that were used at the period. So I import from Germany quite a bit of my materials. Um, European maple, European spruce, cypress. Um, uh, I bring in ebonies and rosewoods and other things like that that I use for different parts of the instrument. Uh, this is actually a button for a, um, a bow. It's the, um, the fitting like this one that you can see here. Oh, right. And this is the button, which is traditionally was turned in ivory. And uh, just working here with a bit of a mammoth ivory to... Mammoth um, ivory? Yeah. As in the mammoth ivory? Mammoth ivory, yeah. How old is that? Ivory. Uh, they say they're about ten to 20,000 years old. Wow. Those tusks. Yeah. Is there much of this stuff left? There's a surprising amount. Um, they've been mining for the last... I don't know, since the 16th century they've been bringing it out of Siberia. And it's this attention to detail that makes his instruments highly sought after by musicians. I really like this bow. Yeah. <laughs> so it's articulating well for you? You're oh, finding absolutely, it, yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's the, the, the whole balance of it is great. So what a musician needs is that the instrument vanishes in their hands. It has to cease to be the object of their attentions and the music becomes the object of their attentions and it's no more than a vehicle. It should shorten the distance between their feeling and the music that comes out.